Uh, I thank you all. Your, your speeches today were fabulous. But just a quick question for Patrick. Um, I've flown through Beijing Airport. It's the most amazing thing, and you know, the, my wife and I have ever seen. I think. Um, how do you reconcile talking to the Chinese government or any of the other governments, like I imagine the Arab states as well? You do a lot of work there about free private spaces in really what are kind of authoritarian, totalitarian type of governments. That was just an overview, uh, what we're doing. And, and so in China, most of our projects, huge projects, are for private clients who have nothing to do with the government. And uh, the real estate entrepreneurs in China are stars. And they have huge following. And they're really very much freer to present product. So this is a kind of company called Soho China, small home office. And there, for instance, they deliver a product which is totally open in the building throughout, whether this be the purchased units will become a retail unit, a residence or an office, sprinkled throughout the tower. Things like this, radical things like this. They had to, in the meantime, climb down on this and they got, because the Chinese start to import more regulations, they're less entrepreneurial. But we've done four huge projects with this, with this company. And the last one is this kind of mega atrium. Uh, I didn't show that image, but a similar one to what I've showed. Uh, under construction, to be, should to be uh, completed. So there's a lot of opportunity. And we have a few other private clients, conglomerates, and entrepreneurs who have found us. We're doing, I'm very much into corporate environments. And, and the, there you need a lot of that complexity and freedom and total flexibility. and and yeah, we do also government projects, but that's, uh, I was just giving you an overview. There it is a little bit different. Of course, but also something like Beijing Airport, they're, they're all, these companies, even though they're, the government holds them, they also have entrepreneurial leaders and there's this kind of quasi-entrepreneurship operating there as well to some extent. Uh, and the Middle East also main projects, projects are private clients. Um, um, in Dubai, for instance, and we established one kind of uh, developer, and we had we created a big product which has retail, hotel, apartments, service departments, offices, uh, food and beverage in one complex building, and this has also, through its planning, changed already several times. There is also more freedom in the in the in the environment there. This, these buildings wouldn't be possible in 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 Europe. Um, I have a question to Titus Gabel in terms of private cities. Uh, do you think that even countries like North Korea might be interested in establishing private cities uh, on the territory to solve their extreme economical inefficiency? Well, North Korea might be a place... No, I don't think so, because um, there's a reason why, why, especially countries like North Korea, have problems. That is because the rulers are completely paranoid when it comes to giving up power. So I think this is this is too extreme. But you have a level below North Korea, say an African country where where a dictator is, that he might be willing to give up some power because he hopes that there will be more income for the state. And he might even ask, okay, you pay me 10% of your, your taxes or fees in our case, right, to, to make it happen. Um, I think um, it's in principle a trade-off between the, the willingness to give up some influence for the rulers against um, monetary compensation and maybe more fame to them because um, uh, then there's more development. I do not see that happen in, in North Korea uh, at the moment. Okay, I didn't know that, but um, uh, you have to have a closer look at that. Many people uh, confront me with, uh, you can just buy a creek island, right? The problem with this and all, all great community thing is you're still subject to the state sovereignty. So if you uh, run something privately but are still subject to all the rules of the, of the state, that is not my, that, uh, I'm not interested in that. It, uh, my product can only <clears throat> uh, be successful if we have a certain autonomy to make our own rules. And uh, I doubt that, the, I mean, I would try to attract North Korean workers, right? And I would say, okay, you, you have certain rights in my area, for example, free speech. Uh, I, I had to probably to give up a lot of things to make it possible in North Korea, and then I probably didn't want to do that. Uh, 
Yes, of course. I mean that that. I wouldn't say that. I mean, all land has sooner or later was confiscated by one party, right? I mean, that is that is a, the, the question you would have, uh, you would have to make in a, in a single case. But our normal case is that we would acquire land from landowners, and theoretically, not it's not even necessary, right? Because you can say we only need to establish this legal framework, and the owners stay as they are. But in practice, it is um, our main source of income is real estate development because we are buying properties before it was a free private city regime and then by doing that, increasing the value alone. That will probably be the main income source in, in, in practice uh, because then you can, because for the fees that, that paying for security and, and some, some court or arbitration system, you cannot make much profit. Uh, as long as you have, say, not more than 100,000 people, um, then you would probably not make profit out of that. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know anything about North Korea, because I don't count what the journalists write about <laughs> North Korea, but uh, one cannot convince majority, but perhaps somebody convinced Mr. Kim. You know, in the dictatorship, the law can be changed uh, from the day on, so perhaps then something has changed. <laughs> Also there, there, there's certainly a truth to what you say that is um, if you have to convince one person or say an oligarchy of five to ten persons, it is much easier than to convince a majority of, of parties because most countries in the world probably have to change the constitution to make uh, something like a free private city happen, not all of them. And then it's a political issue that can take years, right? And so far, you are right. But on the other hand, I have also to take care of my reputation, right? And, and so far, going to certain countries, it's maybe not the best idea. So, uh, Jan this is a question for Janus. Um, what do you believe is the strategic thinking behind the EU's uh, pro-migration policy? I'm, so, I'm sorry, please, please, a, a bit louder. Uh, what do you believe is the strategic thinking behind the EU's migration policy? Uh, migra migration? Mm -hmm. Well, um, the problem is, the problem is that I don't know what were the reasons behind the decision of, of Mrs. Merkel. I don't know. Perhaps uh, the entrepreneurs wanted, wanted to have more, more workforce. Perhaps she wanted to destroy, de destroy the system. Quite, quite possible. I, I don't know the reasons. Uh, anyway, she is now withdrawing from, the, uh, from, the, from her decision. And the problem with immigration is not in migration. The All the America, United States, I mean, has been built by the immigrants. But there was no socialism. Those immigrants knew they will have no social benefits no gratis school, no gratis medicine. If they work, they get money. They knew it. So only those who wanted to work hard go when went to the United States. In Europe, it's exactly opposite. If somebody comes to Europe and wants to work, he's expelled because he's taking a, a, a replace from, from European. And if he wants social benefits, he's accepted. It is, it, is an, it, is an absurd, it is an absurd situation. It's exactly opposite as in normal countries, as, as I told you. Uh, I have a question for Titus. Um, how, uh, let's assume you, you sign the contract and you have a successful free city. How do you protect yourself against breach of contract by the other side? They decide to expropriate you. Um, yeah, that is certainly one of the core questions of the concept. The answer is uh, by investor protection agreements. And um, fortunately, most countries are, um, are pa a party of one or more investor protection agreements. So um, it, it works like that. You, you are in a certain country that has investor protection agreements with, let's say, the US or with, a, with, a, with an area. And, and then you form your company as a U.S. company and you make all your investments there and then if they withdraw the law, it's expropriation. It's like expropriation. You would then go to the arbitration tribunal and say, uh, we, we want, a, want a, uh, basically a judgment on that, a decision on that. And then you have your title and then you can seize their property like hedge funds did with Argentinian planes, right? 
And if they are disregarding this, um, this uh, tribunal uh, decision, they will be kicked out of uh, free, their free trade association or they, will, uh, they cannot afford that, right? So this is our main protection, is, is the investor protections agreements that are in existence worldwide. And you have to legally structure your operating entity uh, as such that they are protected by, uh, um, by such an agreement. Ideally, you can have an, an, an extra protection, uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, investor protection clause in, in, a, in an agreement that you make with the country, which is the best way, right? And if they disregard this, you seize their property in, in foreign lands. But ultimately, you're still relying on any state Yeah, I do, but this is only in the beginning. <laughs> well, look at Singapore. Right. I mean, they have submarines, they have more combat tanks than Germany. Um, they can't be attacked any longer. They could be attacked in the first two, two or three years, if you, if you ha have a look at this book. For the moment, this is the only thing we can do. There is no, um, there, there's no other possibility. But over time, and also if you look at the successful medieval states, city-states, like Genoa or Venice or even the, the Hanseatic League, they could, uh, with, with economic power comes military power, and then they could resist, the Hanseatic League could resist the big powers of that time, like Denmark, right? They, they, they fought a war against Denmark. So if you have enough cities that are willing to support each other, I think um, then you don't have to rely on investor protection <laughs> agreements any longer. But that is the reality at the moment, and it, it is, I'm, I'm very happy that this, this um, possibility is existing at all. Also, a question for Tito Gable. Um, we live in a world where, you know, things change faster and faster. So there's more and more innovation. So one cannot rely on things being the same for the next few decades or generations. So uh, a proprietary community like what you are doing uh, faces the same thing. And um, so if one looks at a community, uh, one of the key problems is the coordination problem. How do you solve the coordination problem? And um, one element of that is that if the property is divided, and this is the argument that Spencer McCallum makes and, and his, his grandfather Spencer Heath, that if the property is divided, then um, it's, it, it, creates, it presents a fundamental challenge to the coordination problem because there's no integrated way to solve that. So then one has to resort to things like, um, uh, what is it when the, when the state intervenes, uh, eminent domain, and, and, and similar things. But so the model that he presents is that there's integrated ownership. So the, in, the entire area is owned by a single entity, the management company, which would be in this case your company. And then it, it rents the property, but the property doesn't belong to individual owners. The entire thing belongs to the owner. And that way you can solve the coordination problem because let's say a road needs to be built. Then the entity can decide to build a road um, whereas if it's subdivided property, then you have holdouts that say, no, you're not going to build the road across my property, which then holds back innovation. So I'm curious in your model, which of those two directions you take? Yeah, I mean, I, I've had all those discussions and I'm in contact with Spencer and, and all that. Look, I'm not a big fan of that. I mean, this is the property in freedom so society for a reason. Um, property is turning sand into gold and a lease can ruin uh, uh, a garden. Why? Because the incentive of being an, an owner is, is so strong and to, to work for yourself and, and your family and, and, and your kids that I think um, that is a, a much more sought after if I, if I offer the opportunity to acquire property. But you can solve that problem by just imposing a, a kind of a covenant on the property like you say, okay, you have to uh, uh, follow the rules of the city, for example, right? If, if the new owner is not signing a contract, then this property transaction is considered invalid. So I don't see the big difference and so forth, but you can be a property owner. For the planning thing, we do not want to have eminent domain, indeed. So you have to foresee in the beginning certain areas and then free, free market urban order, right? Um, that is not a perfect uh, solution, and I'm not against trying out different things. I, I think, Johan, the, 
the first pr free private cities will look different from the third and will look different from the tenth. We will have to try out different models uh, and see what works and what doesn't. But just because you have a coordination problem to forbid people to acquire property is not the way I'm going to follow. Yeah, I know the model, but, but again, I mean, I would rather own my own house and garden than having a share of a, of a, of a that is my view, and other people might see it differently. Um, I don't know how it is now in the United States. I've been there in 1986. And at least in some states, there was a situation where some building law, I don't know, uh, rather technical, and there were the settlement acts. Every settlement, or not every, but the settlement could have its own law. For example, law that you cannot sell the house to anybody who sells it to Jew, to Negro, or to anybody who didn't sign the same the same clausule. And it was legal clausule and very often very often used. So, so it is a private private settlement and and, and, and new yeah. Okay. How much time did you spend studying medieval city constitutions, for example, the constitution of the city of Dortmund, the city of Soest, which were hundredfold replicated in uh, Northern Europe? I did some studies, uh, especially regarding the Hanseatic League. Uh, they were a copy, uh, especially legal system um, of Magdeburg and, and Lübeck, which were the predominant cities at that time. At the end, and Venice also very complicated uh, structure. At the end, I I think that is not feasible for us. We have certain elements in medieval cities, especially when it's coming to to uh, crime and punishment, that you that you can uh, adopt. And um, the um, and so far there are a handful of, of of things where I think it's it's not a bad idea how they did it. But copying, um, look over time, what happened is first there was a group of people who were setting the rules, mostly owners, uh, and then the, 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 the group of people who had a say was always growing. And, and often you had people who misused their power and then were basically uh, thrown out of the city. And you had often the time that there was a constitution, but it wasn't followed, and 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 things like that. So I'm, I'm not a big fan of constitutions because if you look what happened in the last 200 years, um, it's on paper, yes, but it's not followed any longer. Or in 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 countries like Germany, they can change the constitution, or they did change since World War Two, or since the Grundgesetz was was uh, there in '49, they changed it I think 60 times, six zero. <laughs> Um, so what I did is probably I didn't really thoroughly enough the study, um, but um, what I found is some elements that I think are really uh, reasonable. For example, not punishing the citizenship a second time by putting people for a long time in prison and feeding them and paying them. And uh, the, the whole criminal system was more... Um, you have to you you have to show yourself in shame, right? And or you you, get, you even like in Singapore, you get you get beaten, right? And so that uh, all those things, and so you can say, okay, maybe it's a better idea to let people pay something for their crime, and if they cannot pay work, instead of putting them in prison, and we have to pay for that. That is an idea I got from the medieval times, and. Um, but the, the and, and the the constitutions are basically every every city is a little bit different, but mostly it's um, like in, in in Greece. There's a group of people that have have a say, and over time this this group was growing, and other groups were saying we also want to have a say, and 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 so on. That was 
something that is not so much different from our current systems, in my view, but maybe I have not studied this thoroughly enough. The first thing is, uh, what I like about it initially, it comes as an offer when you say there's a multiple of political sensibilities, ideas. You try out one and libertarianism is just one, anarcho-capitalism is kind of one kind of model and there could be other models. And what I foresee, in, uh, and you could be more strict and regulated versus more free, and of course you have a hypothesis that this is the model which would flourish, this is the model which is, which is productivity gains and attractiveness. And you can invent and imagine lots of models, for instance, be more restrictive, uh, ethnically homogenous, uh, highly regulated, but, uh, or religious, you said, and I think these, these all these models, that's our theory, would fail. And, uh, and I guess, but at the same time, uh, we have to try and we, we have to be pragmatic about which models and details, whether it's leasehold or, or property, uh, would, 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 be, would be happening. And I wanted to add one more thing to this, is that, uh, if there is a differentiation of models, they might tie in with the world division of labor that uh, an, an industrial uh, manufacturing kind of place will have a different constitution sensibility rules and, and ethos at place than a kind of a tech industry versus uh, also other provisions. So there might be a kind of uh, from an economic base kind of thinking, a differentiation of various types of cities, the resort cities, the retirement cities, and so on. And they might have different products and rules. So it's not going to be one fit all, but there are huge constraints. Uh, and that's an evolutionary process filtering out which, which are the contemporary flourishing models. And, and I have the similar sensibility to you that, that this would be a kind of the libertarian version would be, would be highly productive. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I, I got a question for, for Tadis as well. Um, couple of things, because your idea was, you know, just made a lot of ideas come out of my head. Um, you've talked about how your relationship is going to be with the host country, right? Uh, and being from Hong Kong, I think one of the most important things is once your city-state is created, how does it seem credible to the other governments? For example, if a trade embargo was placed on your host country, would you be able, sort of like Hong Kong, uh, be seen as to be so different that you will be exempt from it. Uh, and also the relationship in international banking as well. Uh, would, these, would, would, would SWIFT uh, be, be able to do business with the banks set up in your jurisdiction? Um, I, mean, you know, I mean, yes, we will be libertarians and we'll be like, whatever currency rules, then let them, let them, let them use the currency. But it'll, it'll, you know. um, I mean, in Hong Kong, for example, we, our financial secretaries uh, we, we has this complaint about how 30% of the entire budget and bureaucracy now is dedicated in enforcing FACTA. Fact car, sorry, fact car, right. And so how would you be able to avoid you having this particular, so by, by intervened by foreign governments? Um, and more, a more prosaic point, would the citizens in your city, uh, city uh, be, be allowed to carry guns around? Okay, starting from, from, from the last one. Yes, they would, but probably I'm, I'm open to... Uh, I can imagine as an, as an entrepreneur, I'm offering sort of different products, right? And, and one product would be you can uh, bear arms, and another one would be you can own arms, but you shouldn't bear it in the inner city because we don't want that. And the third would be no arms allowed. I'm completely open to that. I, I have no problem with owning your arms, right? So it would be allowed, and it will be allowed in our upcoming project. But probably I will say that, um, that um, in the inner city, you should not bear arms openly, okay? So this is, again, there's no, there's no um, because this is not a, a, an ideological question, it's basically a question of taste, right? And um, you, can, uh, you can say, okay, I don't like that. You're, well, no, your choice, you go to, to another place where it's allowed, right? If you, you prob nobody here in this room will probably like 100% of my decisions that I make in this city, right? But you might like 85%, and this is compared to your current state where you like 10% of the decisions. The government, it's, it's, it's a big improvement. And then I would encourage you to start your own free private city, and we may be set aside if you have a large territory, an experimental field, I call it the freak zone, right? Where maybe the, the anarcho-capitalist can prove that security works, but if I go to people, for example, and say, 
a family is asking me, what about security? I say, oh, well, you can, you can bring your own security and you can choose your own law. Will this be attractive for families and investors? Probably not, right? So, but if you can over time develop this insurance model, maybe the, at the moment, for example, I'm, I'm also hearing that, yeah, the insurance companies will take care of, of that. No, they won't because they are not used to that model. They will maybe take care of that in 20 years from now. And I'm happy to help develop this industry, but at the moment, the, the best solution is the same as a cruise ship or Disneyland does, they have their own private securities. They have not um, multiple securities. So the other questions will be, when, if the host nation has a problem, um, isn't that also affecting us? Certainly this is a, is a risk. What we will do from the beginning is to have ties with um, the respective institutions from the first world, big, uh, be the, the World Bank or all that, so that we don't get into uh, troubles that we, for example, offering financial products which are forbidden everywhere else. So we, we have to make concessions and so far, I would keep them to a minimum, but what our idea is to appear as a first world entity. And if we have contacts to the respective institutions and embassies, uh, etc., then it's easier for us to, to show that we are not part of this banana republic which is breaking all the, the international agreements they have signed. <laughs> no, no, that, um, look, yeah, look, eventually, yes, <laughs> but it's privately financed. I don't know if people will really spend money on that, but the, the point is, it, it would be threatening if we say we will have an own flag and an own Olympic team in the beginning. So we are starting at a special economic zone plus under the sovereignty of the host nation and we, our best sportsmen will be part of their Olympic team. Over time, that might develop into a Hong Kong and over time, that might develop into a Singapore. Complete sovereignty, okay? Now, from the ideological point of view, uh, because uh, not everybody understands the situation in Hong Kong. The free market in Hong Kong was introduced during when Hong Kong was a British colony, and in absolutely no democratic way. It was the governor of the Hong Kong who has done it. Now, just before returning of Hong Kong to China, the governor of uh, Hong Kong tried to introduce democracy in Hong Kong just to, mock the, the, just to make, make troubles to, to, to China. China protested against turning, turning Hong Kong a democracy. And now, and now, there are the movements in Hong Kong who want more democracy. And what do they want? They want to have government controlled prices. They want just a socialism. And China wants to, to stop democracy in Hong Kong. The China wants to keep capitalism in Hong Kong. And, and this movement of, uh, of umbrellas and so on, they want socialism. <laughs> there is a strange situation, but it is as it is. <laughs> yeah, I have another anecdote. It was in 1997 when there were, were already these negotiations about, or it was a little bit before, right? The negotiations about the handing over Hong Kong to China. And, and a couple of years earlier, the, they wanted, the, the British governor wanted to introduce the British-based or British-style social security. And the Chinese communist said, you are not going to, to implement Euro socialism here and destroy Hong <laughs> Kong. <laughs> because because yeah. they want to have a modern, modern capitalism. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my, my question is to Rahim. Uh, the, initiative Titus tells us about is a commercial approach to social change. It's a commercial entrepreneurial venture. And uh, the Hanseatic League and those sort of organizations also had, you could say it was commercially interest driven. Uh, but entrepreneurship in the sense of facing uncertainty, being heroic in the sense at risk, uh, might also be non-commercial. And I was interested in your thoughts about possible, uh, the merits of commercial adventures notwithstanding, the merits of non-commercial entrepreneurship, is, is this something worth thinking about? 
Yes, of course, a lot of ventures, uh, maybe not commercially oriented, but the problem with them is always that you're lacking the market part, and the market part is the disciplining part. It's weeding out uh, the ventures that uh, lead to structures which are not interest of, in the interest of other people. Now, you could uh, start a venture, which is a cultural, scientific venture, uh, which is only in your sole interest or in the interest of, of the generations afterwards. Uh, but then you should bear the cost uh, in general uh, for that, uh, um, and of course it might still be it might still be a venture. I don't think you can overextend the idea of the non-commercial venture to the political sphere, as Schumpeter has talked about the political entrepreneur. He very much focused that the entrepreneurs could be political entrepreneurs, uh, but I think it's much better to put it in more succinct terms, like Professor Hoppe would call them crooks, uh, and I think that's usually what they are, because they, they might be fabulous ventures and, and great ideas, but uh, if you make other people pay for those things, I wouldn't really call it a venture. Uh, uh, the problem is in, in you can only tell uh, afterwards uh, if something is of merit. Uh, in the beginning, like every, uh, even commercial ventures are indistinguishable from foolish endeavors because you don't know. And the, the things that look very foolish at the moment might turn out to be commercially viable, might turn out to be great advances uh, for science, for art, and so on. Uh, so I think it needs some kind of discipline. And it's either the discipline by having skin in the game yourself, or it's the discipline of the market uh, that corrects the kind of narcissistic uh, uh, materialization of, of your own ideas, but potentially at the expense of others. And that always means that there are a whole lot of potential ventures that cannot be realized because you had, uh, you controlled the means that are lacking elsewhere and that you won't ever see. Uh, so of course, there can be great results of political entrepreneurship, uh, but I think economics tells us that there's a whole lot of things that we don't see, all those ventures that could be there but are not, because there's this great huge uh, uh, venture, which might have something positive to it, but we don't see uh, the, the whole cost and the true cost of that. I'm afraid it's not connected to Hungary, but seeing as the conversation is basically about free cities um, at the moment and about decentralization, I wondered if, as the premier historian here, Professor Stone would say whether he thinks that decentralization was an important part in what's been called the European miracle. Oh, it's a good one. Um. I mean, I, I've got my doubts about small city-states because if you look at what's happened to them in Italy, there's a sort of pattern that, um, first of all, the, the people who are excluded, including a lot of migrants into these rich places, Florence, um, start causing a lot of trouble. So you have uh, internal strife and then uh, Montagues and Montagues and Capulets fighting um, or, uh, among themselves over Verona. And then they are not terribly defensible. I mean, Venice was defensible because of marshes and uh, Genoa to a large extent as well. But the others are not terribly de de defensi defensible. And after a bit, there's a noise from the nearest Alp and it's Swiss mountaineers in a bad mood with knives who, <laughs> who, who more or less wipe out these city-states. Uh, I mean, this is a big problem with, uh, with things like Magdeburg or Recht you referred to. Uh, so I'm not as hopeful as all that. Uh, on the other hand, it's certainly true that uh, small in Europe was, is often, was very beautiful. I mean, if you look at the, the, the way in which uh, England, France, Germany, uh, each, dis each district is different. It's got different accents, different cooking. It is it's certainly very healthy to have that kind of thing, provided you can protect it. Yeah, thank you, Professor Stone. And this is, this is certainly one of the other issues, the, uh, the defensibility. And uh, Prince Hans Adam of Liechtenstein has pointed out in his book, uh, The State in the Third Millennium, that it is the military technology that is also one of the reasons why those uh, medieval cities flourished, because 
you were capable of defending yourself with behind big walls, even against larger armies. And it was not always successful, but it, it led to uh, many of the, especially of the German independent city-states to remain over a very long period of time. Um, maybe we will have another a technological in, um, invention um, uh, that is bringing now back the balance towards the defender versus the attacker. I don't know, but in any case, um, I think Venice remained for 1,100 years, right? So it's, it's uh, I mean, I'm not targeting 1,100 years, but I would, would be happy if the idea would so survive for 100 years. And I see, for example, Singapore, um, is only capable of, of keeping their situation, at least it's what Lee Kuan Yew thinks, because they have a big army. And, and what happened, um, I think we need to address this point. Uh, when we're looking for free private cities, we are looking geographically, and we would prefer areas that can be defended more easily. That is very true. On the other hand, you have cities like Monaco, which are basically impossible to defend because of their um, uh, geographical situation. And they're still existing because they have diplomatically managed to, to go through all that. So I have hope that um, despite this is a, is a problem, that if we can ally with bigger forces, like Ragusa did, they paid tribute to the, uh, to the Sultan of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, so they were left alone. Then, and they had an, had an ally in them. And then you had the Hanseatic League, they tried to, uh, and the Southern German uh, uh, City uh, Association, uh, Süddeutscher Städtebund, um, they al allied amongst each other. So I think there are answers to that, uh, to that question that, that are giving some hope. The issue of violence and defense and so on is, is, is a big topic and I, I feel, his, if, to, if you look historically, there's something which is disappearing, I would argue, and will be totally gone, in particular with it, within, let's say within the advanced arenas of world civilization and in places like Europe. Um, Liechtenstein doesn't need an army, I'm sorry to say, who, and, and of course there's, there's this kind of world of very uneven development and massive amount of backwardness a lot to do with the tragedy of the colonies becoming independent under kind of socialist hegemony and they all start on the wrong foot and remain backward and couldn't develop. And I think in terms of uh, um, um, advanced civilization, uh, um, uh, also within a country, uh, let's say this defense, uh, I think development would make that more and more um, um, unnecessary to defense. And so I'm not sure if Singapore now needs a big army. Uh, I would question these these notions, and and also in terms of police force, prisons, and physical monopoly of violence or establishing. You uh, you know you talked before that you in terms of criminal justice and and prisons and and punishment and and flogging and so on. I think this is outlandish to me in a, in, a, in a civilized world. We still have a lot of violence in the Western societies, but where is it coming from? And I think this will wash out, and in a, in a, in a free market society wouldn't exist. Uh, it's unimaginable for any of us. We all live longer, we, we treasure our health. Uh, uh, we would never consider physical violence as an option where we have our teeth kicked in or, or, or uh, our legs broken. It's totally outlandish and it would be very soft ways of, of freezing, freezing your account. Or, uh, and, and the violence which is still in American cities and, 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 and in the Western is purely the subsidizing of backwardness. 100% in my view is the welfare state which generates this violence. Where everybody else, violence is disappearing and on, on grow is disappearing. And the strange thing is that the, 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 these kind of ghettos and, and, and a brutality of ganglands and ghettos and, and, and crime and violence is all a, a kind of post 60s, 70s, 80s kind of condition and was on the way out through the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. So that would be something which is totally t to disappear, and I think on the on the world development level as well. So I'm not sure if we have to, if that's kind of an eternal condition, part of the human condition, kind of physical violence as a, as a factor. Uh, we would all be disciplined quickly enough by by maybe um, 
by having our uh, Google account frozen for, for a day brings us in line, most of us <laughs> with anything we would ever want, uh, and, and we will never, we'll, we'll never resort to violence. I mean, so that's why I find it a little bit kind of, um, I'm not, maybe I'm an optimist, but in, on a historical perspective, uh, a non-issue. Anybody on this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I... <laughs> no. I, I think what's interesting is uh, uh, that uh, the Germans indeed, and, and you're German, I'm yes, Austrian, pretty close to that, uh, uh, they show very low levels of uh, violence and readiness for violence, but on the other side they're very easy to rule, and I think that's uh, uh, both uh, <laughs> parts of the same picture. Uh, so I would not expect violence to disappear, I think it's hidden uh, to a large extent, because it's so easy to extort uh, uh, money and to construct uh, uh, basically uh, coercive systems without the need for violence, which is not always a good sign. So when, of course, migrants from, from the Middle East are coming, I don't think that they're inherently more evil people. Uh, it's just to a certain extent, uh, they are maybe far less easy to rule. Uh, and. Uh, uh, thus might <laughs> uh, might react and are counter reacting and we're seeing that that they react to the police force and you can just call them out and stop and they just resist and uh, so you need to be ready to increase the count of violence uh, to uh, cope uh, uh, with that. Uh, so I'd, I'd, I'd rather predict that uh, open or visible violence might increase a bit and I don't see it necessarily as a bad uh, symptom, uh, just a kind of correction of an unsustainably uh, low <laughs> level of violence. And I still hope uh, for, for culture, and, and I think a large part of it is, is culturally, the cultural evolution, I think in, in, on, on the basis it's positive, it's a very positive kind of evolution. But uh, I think the point where it's used for positive productivity uh, has been surpassed and it's basically used to control a docile population which is domesticated and, and f really easy to rule. And thus a lot of the brightest and most productive people nowadays are captured inside these totalitarian system which extract a lot of the energy and intelligence for uses which are I think distortive and, and consumptive and destructive. Uh. Well this is depending where you are Patrick. I think if you are on a seastead with a selected crowd of libertarians, yes. Uh, probably not, no, no need to, to build a, a big force but pirates, real pirates, right? So the, the one thing is true, and it remains true in my view, is the easiest way to increase your living standard is take away things from other people. That's the easiest way, right? And if, uh, if you can use force and the other people are not really unwilling to use force, it's even easier. Because you don't have to apply force, you just threat, make a threat. Um, and in so far, I cannot afford as a as an entrepreneur that is offering security or guaranteeing security that I rely on that people will behave uh, the right way, right? So I have to, um, because especially if we are in a backwarded environment, I mean, and we will be successful and wealthy, I mean, we are number one target for people who just will come to steal. And in so far, um, we have to be prepared, um, uh, like you show a friendly face and carry a big stick. And we are going to do that. And over time, we will see. I, I mean, eventually, maybe the world will be so civilized that we don't need it. But I'm not seeing that now. It may happen. Uh, I just got one more question for Titus. Um, you said that the, uh, the, the majority of the income is going to be relied on selling land either freehold or leasehold. Um, what currency would the payment be settled in? And what currency would your civil servant be paid in? Yeah, um, good question. Basically, there, will, there won't be any, any currency that is uh, mandatory for, for the residents to use, but we have to define a currency in which the payments are made, the fees are paid, or the civil servants are paid. So. 
We would probably use a regional, regional currency or one of the big currencies for that. But I have thought about a clause that we could also switch uh, to payment in gold, right? Because uh, if, we, if we say that there's, a, that there's a, a fiat currency that we are accepting payments in, I mean, this, can, this, this, this currency can basically be devaluated uh, over a couple of, of months, and then you, well, you have only this claim. So a fallback would be inflation adjustment by uh, any kind of formula or by um, uh, by uh, by a provision that we can demand the payment in gold instead. In practice, I would say it will be one of the big currencies, for example, US dollar. And but you can do amongst yourself whatever you want. If there is a cryptocurrency. Uh, coming up that is established all, all over the world. I'm, I'm happy to switch to that, but f for you, what you as residents would do, it's free banking. You use whatever currency you want. <laughs> Example of, of, of Zanzibar. Zanzibar was uh, independent for several years and was trying to build socialism and uh, <laughs> began to, to, print, to print money, because it is swallowed by, by the Tanganyika, by Tanzania. And uh, the, the population began to use the silver talars edited by Maria Teresa in, 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 uh, in Austria, Austria, but they used the uh, Zanzibarian currency only for one aim, to pay taxes to the, <laughs> to the government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's in a way also the case here, right? Uh, just a point, I may be wrong about but I heard the IMF does not allow members to use gold as currency. And you mentioned applying to, you know, first world organizations like the World Bank. And uh, would you then not apply to the IMF? Or no, we I'm wouldn't be a member, right? We would basically ride on the back of our host nation. But we, since we have the rights, this is a special zone. I mean, if they're making problems to us, we will see. But I would say this is only a, a backup clause. But I'm relatively sure we can figure out a way around that. <laughs> so just a question for Patrick. Um, so how do you envision the transition to destatizing or privatizing public spaces? Um, the way all the privatizations have been happening, whether it's a postal service or um, uh, television, uh, it's, it's you put out uh, tenders and you look at uh, bits and you go by the economic most viable bit and uh, I think it will be fascinating to uh, and, and if they're overbid and somebody else picks up and I'm I was add to something this and I think transformations which which some of the cities should go through would be much accelerated I'm working at the moment on something I called walkable London and a kind of heavy pedestrianization uh, a, a project and uh, and individually uh, I've talked to various entrepreneurs and counselors and people there they would love a lot of streets would love that and the and those people who live on the streets would be happy to do to see that and uh, that ties in beautifully I think with this it would be tendering process um, yeah I have a question to the to the Eastern European countries and their uh situation Hungary or Poland um, uh, concerning migration issues and their uh, force to stay independent. Uh, can we elaborate on this uh, in a way uh, predicting the future uh, about the tensions within the EU and, uh, and, and can we dare or can somebody of you dare a prognosis of how these tensions might end up sovereignty uh, which is a strong, defendable issue still for quite uh, freely or newly independent countries uh, and their tension within the European unity. Well, it is very difficult to see the future when uh, there are different complots made by, uh, by different group of groups of people. There is no natural processes uh, here. And uh, well, I, I, I hate the present present Polish government. Uh, they are they are d d democrats who are against the rule of law. So I, I prefer to be protected by by the laws and by the majority. But but uh, 
Uh, now they have seen what they have done signing the Treaty of Lisbon. And, and they are now realizing my receipt. I, five years ago, six years ago, when I was asked uh, what to do, uh, when to get out of the European Union, I said, we, we don't have to get out. We, sh we should behave in such a way that they should start to kick us off of the European Union. <laughs> and they are doing exactly, <laughs> exactly what I was doing. <laughs> but there is, uh, today, Today, uh, Mr. Asselrod, the Prime Minister of Foreign Affairs of Luxembourg, I told you, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Germany, they are the most, uh, and, and, uh, and he said that uh, if Poland will behave this way, so the Poland uh, sh should be out of European Union. But there's a problem. The Treaty of Lisbon <laughs> doesn't have any, any way to, to, to get rid of, of the country. It's impossible, <laughs> Theoretic, theoretically. <laughs> so I don't know <laughs> what we do with this, because, because it is formally impossible. Uh, so Polish government should ask for it, but surely they don't want to eat it, because, you, you, I, I must tell you, the, the Poles are the nation which is more, the most European in, from all the, all the countries. So if, if this party would say openly that they want to get out of the European Union, they would lose the power. <laughs> they cannot say it. They only say, we demand our national rights and so on and so on and so on. And they wait for the European Union to kick, to kick the Poland, Poland off, which is impossible. <laughs> so I cannot predict what will happen. Situation is absurd <laughs> and, and everything is possible. For example, uh, uh, there, was po there was a law of European Union that the European Union cannot punish a country. Uh, to punish a country, uh, they will have the... Uh, uh, no. Uh, uh, no. Liberum veto. The, 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 only one country can veto such a decision. So there was sure that Hungary, because Poland and Hungary are uh, always friends, <laughs> the Hungary uh, will vo veto it and there will be nothing. So they have invented that they have a, a, they will sue both Poland and Hungary and then both will be excluded from the voting. <laughs> I mean, no, no, no veto, which of course it is against, against the letter of law, but everything is possible in the European Union because all the laws are, are incomprehensible, they are, they are complicated and, and nobody understands uh, anything. So they will say that it is okay and that's all. I cannot tell you what will happen. I'm sorry. Uh, it is easier to, to uh, see what will be done in uh, 200 years with, with, with the climate, uh, <laughs> but I cannot tell <laughs> what will be with the weather tomorrow and with the, with the European Union after, after two weeks. Just as a follow-up to that previous inquiry, what do you see in terms of the Visegrad group as acting as a, a counter block within the EU? either for security or as defense against the, the EU and its overtures? It is, the, the, the question is um, not properly posed. We cannot act against EU because we are the part of EU. Uh, so so you, you cannot pose the question this way. It is like, uh, like uh, say, the, um, the Cornwalls uh, acted against the uh, United Kingdom. It is impossible. So, uh, Polish, uh, Polish government is not united. There are different factions in the ruling party. And uh, there, are, there is very attack of the ruling uh, person in party, which is Mr. Kaczynski, who is only a, a member of parliament. He is neither a minister nor prime minister or anything, not a president. And they say it is an absurd situation. I said, no. During communist time, there was a first sec secretary who was only a member of, of parliament. He was neither prime minister nor not the president, but he was ruling. And exactly the same is Mr. Kaczynski, uh, who, is, uh, who, is, uh, who is a president of the ruling party. And he is just a, a, a simple, a simple. So I cannot, cannot tell. Uh, I cannot answer, answer that question. I really don't know. Uh, the golden rule in Poland is just try to do what, I what you think it is rational now and don't think about the future. <laughs> because because, because I, I cannot tell you. I, I'm sorry.